Thank you so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, the Biden administration opposing Israel's plans to invade the last Hamas stronghold in Rafah. As Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and President Joe Biden speak on the phone for the first time since Senator Chuck Schumer called for Netanyahu to be replaced. We'll take a look at the growing disagreements between Washington and Israel. It's been called one of the most important free speech cases in the generation as the Supreme Court hears arguments on just how far the government can go on recommending the removal of online viewpoints. With Mother's Day coming up, we're going to hear stories of brave mothers and the battles they fought from Dr. Nicole Sapphire of Fox News and the gospel marketing campaign known as He Gets Us, taking its commercials from the Super Bowl to the Olympics. All those stories and more ahead today, right here on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. Let's get right to it in Israel as the government is considering an assault on the last Hamas stronghold in the city of Rafah. And after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and President Joe Biden spoke on the phone for the first time since Senator Chuck Schumer called for the Israeli people to replace Netanyahu in new elections. As Chris Mitchell now reports from Jerusalem, the phone call is one of the latest developments in an unprecedented confrontation between the United States and Israel. Israel's prime minister says he had a long phone call with U.S. President Joe Biden about the Jewish nation's main goals in Gaza. The elimination of Hamas, the release of all our hostages, and the promise that Gaza will no longer pose a threat to Israel. He's agreed to send a team to Washington to discuss major disagreements, like the Biden administration's position that Israel shouldn't invade Rafah, Hamas's last major stronghold. Our position is that Hamas should not be allowed a safe haven in Rafah or anywhere else. But a major ground operation there would be a mistake. It would lead to more innocent civilian deaths, worsen the already dire humanitarian crisis, deepen the anarchy in Gaza, and further isolate Israel internationally. Netanyahu insists Hamas will continue to be a major threat if Israel is not allowed to attack the remaining terrorist elements in Rafah. How do we define victory? We define it as a, the destruction of Hamas's military and governing capability. Still, the Biden administration asserts it's on board with Israel's goals, even if it appears opposing an attack on Rafah undermines those goals. The president emphasized his bone-deep commitment to ensuring the long-term security of Israel, and he affirmed, as he did in the State of the Union, that Israel has a right to go after Hamas, the perpetrators of the worst massacre of the Jewish people since the Holocaust. The United Nations World Food Program says if the fighting doesn't halt in Gaza, nearly half of its two million people could starve to death. There are about 1.1 million people in catastrophic level of hunger. The food agency asserts if it can't get 300 trucks of aid into Gaza every day, the famine could spread all across the Gaza Strip. Israel says it's not stopping the aid trucks, but the U.N. fails to distribute much of the food, and trucks are often hijacked or looted by Hamas and criminal gangs. The Israeli government said its troops killed some 20 terrorists and arrested 200 more in a major hospital that Hamas tried to take back control. Every single hospital that we've searched has been used by Hamas as a weapon of war. The army also killed a top Hamas commander who was armed and hiding in the Shifa hospital. This morning, the White House also announced Secretary of State Blinken will visit Saudi Arabia and Egypt in coming days in an effort to broker a hostage deal and cease fire. And CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell is joining us now from Jerusalem with more. So let's begin there, Chris. Secretary Blinken on his way back to the region. What kind of ceasefire would Israel be willing to accept? Well, I think Ephraim, right now they'd be willing to accept a limited ceasefire. I mean, before it was about six months, uh, they would be willing to re have a release of many, if not all, of the hostages. And I tell you what they don't want. They don't want the release of Palestinian prisoners with blood on their hands that have committed terror attacks and murdered uh, Israelis. Another thing they won't accept, Ephraim, is a permanent ceasefire, and that's something Hamas has been uh, saying for many, many weeks. And they won't accept that Israeli forces would leave the Gaza Strip. Uh, in effect, what would happen if there was a permanent ceasefire, 
And if Israeli forces would leave the Gaza Strip, Hamas would, in effect, uh, remain in control of at least some of the Gaza Strip and, and reportedly or presumably be able to take over more of the Gaza Strip. So they feel like it's really critical that they get into this last major stronghold and eliminate Hamas completely. Chris, President Biden has basically ruled out support for a major Israeli ground offensive in Rafah. Will Israel go ahead with or without support from the administration? Well, Ephraim, that's really the big question right now. The crucial question is whether or not they will go in. Uh, you know, for weeks, Israel has been saying Rafah is the last remaining stronghold. There's four major battalions there of Hamas. Uh, what the U.S. is saying is that they want a limited sort of a special ops kind of operation uh, and that this operation into Gaza can be uh, they can succeed in their goals by using these kind of uh, operations. Uh, the U.S. disagrees that uh, no operation means that Israel can't defeat Hamas. Uh, you know, the U.S. is saying that they, they don't want a safe haven for Hamas, they, but they don't want a major ground operation. So this really has been the key and the main point of a contention between the U.S. and uh, Israel. Uh, Israel's aims, like I said, they want to defeat these last four Hamas battalions. They want to get the uh, Hamas leadership. They believe that Sinwar is there. Number two, Mohammed Deef uh, may be there in, uh, in Rafah. And uh, they also strategically want to take control of what's called the Philadelphia Corridor. This is right on the Egyptian border. This is where uh, they may be as many as 12 tunnels that are able to smuggle in arms. And uh, that's one of their, their aims. And also, one of their main goals is to find and rescue those remaining hostages. Chris, the big headline here is the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. What can you tell us about the attempts to get aid to the people who need it there? Well, Israel says they're getting a lot of aid into Gaza, but they say that Hamas is getting a lot of that aid. And uh, we're really getting only one side of the story out of Gaza. Israel is saying the blame goes on Hamas, not Israel. Uh, one report just in the Times of Israel today was that it's almost impossible to get aid from the south to the north, where apparently a lot of the hunger is. Uh, looting is rampant, uh, according to testimony by some of these aid workers. It's a very dangerous environment. Some of these trucks can only get so far before they're, they're commandeered by local criminal gangs or Hamas themselves. And, uh, and many people take the aid for themselves. It's not getting to where it re really needs to go. What do we know about the Hamas commander who is reported to be killed by Israel in the Shifa hospital raid yesterday? Well, Ephraim, this seems to be one more senior uh, Hamas operative that uh, Israel has been able to eliminate. Uh, this was in the assault on the El Shifa Hospital, Gaza's main hospital. His name is Faik Bahub, and he was a top official in Hamas's internal security. And he was operating and directing uh, activity from inside that Shifa hospital in the Gaza City. Uh, the military earlier had said it was conducting a high-precision operation in parts of that medical complex. And this was uh, after what apparently happened was uh, senior Hamas militants had regrouped in in that hospital and uh, we're directing attacks from the compound. You may remember, Ephraim, this was the hospital where there was actually circuit control or a closed circuit uh, video of some of the hostages that had been taken in to that hospital months ago. I recall that indeed. I know you've been busy. What's coming up on this new edition of Jerusalem Dateline today? Well, we have an update story on uh, the latest here in uh, in the region, and also we have an interview with Ivy Hyman. He was in our report. We have an extended interview with him. He's really on the front lines of the information war. We also have a story from Iran. Uh, but while the world is being distracted by the war in the south with Hamas and the north with Hezbollah, Iran's nuclear program is continuing, and that's a, that's a major issue. We also have an interview with Tony Perkins, and uh, he's talking in a larger sense what's really at stake here. Uh, he believes Western civilization is on the line and, and the need to stand with Israel. And finally, uh, Ephraim, we also have a part of our interview with Gordon Robertson, who prays uh, from here for Israel 
and uh, the Jewish people. All right, lots to look forward to. Thank you so much, Chris Mitchell from Jerusalem. Always please stay safe. We appreciate your insights and we are praying for you and the entire team there in Israel. I want to remind you, you can see the latest from Jerusalem Dateline tonight on the CBN News Channel. It begins at 8 Eastern. You can also watch it on the CBN News app or you can find it on YouTube as well. Coming up, here in the United States, it's being called one of the biggest free speech cases in a generation. Whether the Biden administration went too far by pressuring social media sites to censor certain content. We're going to have that story for you when we come back. You're watching CBN News Watch. Back now with a major case challenging the strength of the First Amendment on the Internet age at the U.S. Supreme Court. The justices heard arguments on whether the federal government can encourage social media platforms to remove posts they consider to be misinformation. Washington correspondent Abigail Robertson brings us the story. Justices appeared skeptical of claims that the Biden administration went too far in encouraging social media companies to moderate controversial content. They specifically addressed topics related to COVID-19 and election security. Some might say that the government actually has a duty to take steps to protect the citizens of this country, and you seem to be suggesting that that duty cannot manifest itself in the government encouraging or even pressuring uh, platforms to take down harmful information. Attorneys General from Louisiana and Missouri joined five individuals in suing the Biden administration for violating their First Amendment free speech rights. They claim the federal government coerced social media platforms to suppress conservative voices by taking down posts deemed misleading. Pressuring platforms in back rooms shielded from public view is not using the bully pulpit at all. That's just being a bully. While lower courts sided with the states, the justices seem to favor the Biden administration. I'm so actually that, inaccurate about you know, that, something the troops are doing, U.S. troops are doing, and they're, you know, you should take that down. It's factually inaccurate. It's uh, harming the war effort. It's not accurate. Brad Jacob from Regent University says the heart of this case depends on whether or not the federal government took part in coercion. But I think that's really the whole issue. Was this just a gentle, hey, we'd like you to kind of encouragement? Or was this, you better do this or you're going to be in trouble with maybe implicit sanctions? How much did the government push is really at the issue. He adds another key is that social media companies are privately owned and operated. My guess is that the court is going to largely position itself as saying social media is private business. It doesn't have to respect the First Amendment. If you don't like the way Twitter X moderates your speech, then don't use that platform. Lisa McPherson from Public Knowledge believes federal agencies and social media platforms should be able to collaborate as long as it doesn't cross a line. The more clearly the court can help us understand where that line is, the more we can make sure that content moderation happens in the public interest, but doesn't step over the line and start to impinge on First Amendment freedoms. The Biden administration argues they do not use coercive threats to control platforms editorial content. There's also been no punishment if or when the companies decline to moderate flagged content. A ruling is expected in June. Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Still ahead, Mother's Day coming up. We are talking with Dr. Nicole Sapphire, a teenage mother herself. She's sharing stories about brave moms who took on health problems, abuse, poverty, and so much more. We're going to hear from her right after this. Stay with us. Mother's Day is not that far away on this week's Healthy Living program. Lori Johnson speaks with the author of a book full of stories about brave moms who battled health issues, poverty, abuse, and so much more. The author, Dr. Nicole Sapphire, she has a unique story herself as a teen mom who chose life and went on to become a celebrated physician. Well, a lot of our viewers immediately recognize your name and your face because you are a Fox News contributor. You are also a medical doctor, a board certified radiologist who later went on to practice at Memorial Sloan Kettering, one of the best cancer hospitals in the nation. You've written three books. So what's really interesting, I say all that because a lot of people don't know you 
were a teen mother. Your motherhood story is absolutely fascinating. You found out you had an unplanned pregnancy at the age of 17, and you chose to have your child. And, you know, a lot of people say you, you can't do that and still pursue your career goals. In fact, that's one of the main reasons people say you should have an abortion is because you can't have the dream career you want, and yet you're, look at your life. Can you talk about your own personal story of motherhood? Well, I can't tell you how grateful I am that I was able to share not only my motherhood journey in the book, but other mothers as well. But, you know, in the book, I really dive into some of the details of, you know, my entire motherhood journey that I haven't been public about before. I was an honor student in high school, an athlete. Um, and yes, I was that statistic. I became pregnant at the age of 17 and I was faced with a huge obstacle. Do I continue on with the pregnancy or do I not? I can tell you that, you know, a lot of people around me, not everyone, but a lot of people around me told me that if I continued with the pregnancy, that I would never fulfill my dreams of being a doctor and kind of going on to do all the things that I had been working so hard up until that point to do. Ultimately, I did make the decision that I'm having my child. And thank goodness I did because he is the greatest gift. He is now my oldest of three boys. But that being said, it wasn't easy. I was that pregnant teenager walking the halls of my high school my senior year. I gave birth about six weeks before I graduated. My parents were holding my newborn was holding my newborn son in the stands of my high school graduation. And then from there, I can tell you, he was also at my college graduation, my medical school graduation, and he's been with me every step of the way. That is an absolutely heartwarming and beautiful story. Thank you for sharing it with us. So can you tell us a little bit more about what it was like making that decision to have the baby or to not have it? And what led you to decide to have him? Well, I can tell you it was a very lonely time. Um, you know, I was, you know, a teenager. I lost a lot of friends when I made the decision to have the baby. My boyfriend and I at the time also broke up. And, you know, my parents were also a little wary of, you know, what my future held. But ultimately, I kind of had to just look inside of myself to make that decision. I couldn't look to anybody else to help me make the decision because I'm the reason I was in that situation. And I'm the person who's going to make the decision as to what to do. Um, I was very faithful at the time. You know, I used to go to Bible study, rosary, teen mass. You know, one of the most heartbreaking things that happened um, when I found out I was pregnant was that. I was asked not to go to teen mass anymore. You know, looking back, maybe I can understand because they didn't want me to be, you know, a bad influence on some of the other adolescents, but it was heartbreaking at the time. But that didn't mean that I questioned my faith or I questioned God. It was unfortunately just a disappointing moment with my church. Um, but I really looked inward. I looked to myself and I looked to faith. I was reading my teen Bible a ton during that time and I was trying to draw strength um, from my Bible. And ultimately, I knew that I was just going to take a different path to reach my goals. Yeah, it's going to be a little harder. But you know, taking the road less traveled can sometimes be the most rewarding thing you do. And you can watch more from Dr. Sapphire about her new book called Love Mom on this week's edition of Healthy Living. It's happening today on the CBN News Channel. You can watch it this afternoon at 2.30 Eastern and this evening at 6.30 Eastern. You can also see it on the CBN News app and you can watch it on YouTube as well. Coming up, a gospel marketing campaign which ran commercials during the Super Bowl will also bring its message to this year's Olympic Games. We're going to have that story for you when we come back. Stay with us. A gospel marketing campaign that calls on Christians to love their neighbor is going global. The organization behind the, behind the Get a He Gets Us campaign, best known for its Super Bowl ads, is taking its message to the Summer Olympic Games. CBN's Brody Carter shows us how it's preparing for the world stage. We sponsor uh, Joe Gibbs Racing, so we have Ty Gibbs, his grandson. Uh, we we are the paint out on that car like eight times during the year. Everybody from like Taylor Lautner to um, Russell Wilson, 
Uh, we had Michael Pittman was working with us. He was a fifth leading receiver in terms of catches in the NFL this year. From sports stars to actors and artists looking to convey their view of Jesus. He Gets Us has become a top 100 advertiser nationwide. Most recently spent an estimated $17 million on Super Bowl ads dedicated to the gospel message of loving your neighbor. I've certainly heard people question the amount of, of spending that we have, uh, but what we're trying to do is if, if we followed the example of Jesus, both as, as Jesus followers, but also people who are skeptical about Christianity, the level of generosity that he taught, if we actually did that, would be profound. The company is moving in 2024 to expand its reach, including this summer at the Olympics in Paris. The NFL draft is coming up at the end of April. It's going to be in Detroit. That's a that's a really cool event. You'll see he gets us doing a bunch of advertising, getting its message out there. And then also during the during the Republican and Democratic national conventions, and then all the way through you know, the presidential election in November. The group's data from Super Bowl ads show these events are prime opportunities to grow its brand and message that the love of Jesus is for everyone. In the 10 days following the game, it tracked over 2 million users on its webpage, each one spending just over two minutes on the site. Inserting that message of Jesus' love into the climate that we have today, where we've got loneliness and anxiety, and significant political differences, I, I think that's a very provocative idea to suggest to the American people. And behind this message is a goal, to get people to make a choice by visiting the He Gets Us website and signing up for a Bible reading plan or joining an online small group. Brody Carter, CBN News. Time now for your Tuesday Tweetable. This is a message I pray brings motivation to you and your day. I also hope you'll post tag tweet and share it with those in your circles of influence. Forgiveness is yours. It's free. You don't have to fight for it. You don't have to work for it, but you do have to accept it and receive it. With that word, I pray you make today a terrific Tuesday and be sure to have yourself a wonderful rest of the week. Well, that will do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can always find more of our programs on the CBN News Channel. You can find them there at any time as well as online. That address is CBNNews.com. Take a moment. Let us know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us, newswatch at CBN.com. You can also reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you here tomorrow.